Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second webinar of WPI series, Women of the Impressionist Circle. I'm Elizabeth Garave, Executive Director of the Wildenstein Plattner Institute, and we will be hosting several programs this year in honor of the 150th anniversary of the birth of the Impressionist Movement in 1874. This particular series focuses on women in the wider Impressionist circle who were responsible for ushering this celebrated avant-garde movement into the pantheon of art history. Our program this afternoon will focus on one such industrious figure who is instrumental in establishing an extraordinary American collection of Impressionist art now housed at the Hillstead Museum in Farmington, Connecticut. Theodate Pope Riddle and the museum she founded are not very well known outside of the United States. Designed as a home for her family in 1901, before women were licensed to be architects in Connecticut, Hillstead today houses Pope Riddle's exceptional collection of masterworks by Monet, Degas, Manet, Cassatt, and Whistler, all displayed in situ as originally installed. Telling us about this extraordinary collection and the woman responsible for establishing it is our esteemed speaker for today, Dr. Anna Swinborn. Anna is executive director and CEO of the Hillstead Museum, and she is also an independent art historian, curator, and celebrated educator. Her noteworthy former projects include a collection catalog for the late David Rockefeller, an exhibition on Paul Cezanne landscapes for Princeton University Art Museum. And from 1999 through 2009, Anna was on the painting and sculpture curatorial staff of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, where she created a two volume catalog on the unparalleled Nyarkos collection and curated either independently or with chief curators Kurt Barnado and John Elderfield major exhibitions on the work of Vincent van Gogh, Pablo Picasso, Edward Manet, and James Enzer. She has also taught art history at Miss Porter School and as a visiting professor of art history at Trinity College. In addition to being a trustee of the Hillstead Museum, Anna is a member of the board of managers of Lewis, of Lewis Walpole Library at Yale University, and the Art Advisory Committee of King Badoon Foundation, United States. Anna, I am honored to have you here with us today, and now I will turn the screen over to you. Um, before Anna starts speaking, just a reminder, we're gonna be having a Q&A after Anna finishes her presentation, so please get your questions ready and put them in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. screen. Okay, Anna, over to you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, I am delighted to be here with you today sharing all of this wonderful information about someone who is both a personal inspiration to me and I think just an extraordinary historic figure about which we are learning more every day. And um, so what I'm hoping is in my brief talk, if you are inspired to learn more, you will either come to see us here at Hillstead or reach out to me directly and we would be delighted to continue the dialogue. So what I'm going to do is share a screen because I am trained as an art historian, as you heard, and we essentially talk through pictures. And I think I am frozen. Excuse me just a sec. I will stop sharing and start again. Because of course we did a run through previously. Now it's not functioning. Uh-oh. Another option you could do, Anna, is to send the presentation to our administrator, Janet, who might yeah. be able to. Well, I think what I'll do, I might have gotten myself a little bit in a twist by starting the slideshow before. 
Uh, and let me see if I can do it now. Yeah. Okay, I think, what is it? The sixth time always works, not the third time is the charm. Um, so we are going to, as uh, we have discussed, talk about Theodate Pope Riddle. Born in 1867, she was the only child of a Mr. Alfred Pope and Ada Brooks Pope uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. So having spent a childhood of somewhat luxurious means in Cleveland, when she finished her primary schooling, her parents sent her to Connecticut to the very renowned uh, private boarding school for young women called Miss Porter's School. She arrived there in 1886. I'm showing you somewhat humorous photographs of her with her friends. Um, in the next two years that she had in Connecticut, she essentially fell in love with the town Farmington, which uh, as a resident here, it took me only a little bit of time to understand Farmington was a very large expanse of essentially farms. It was mostly rural with a, an old historic main street and entirely different than the somewhat gritty yet upper class uh, background that she had had in Cleveland. So by gritty, I mean a large metropolis back in the 1860s and 70s that was um, somewhat filled with a lot of people and not necessarily uh, a natural paradise as she found here. She so loved the experience of being at school here with women her age and under the tutelage of some very inspiring both uh, female professors and teachers, but also the founder of the school, Miss Sarah Porter, that when it came to graduating and she was supposed to then return back to Ohio to enter society as women of her position were expected to do, she refused. Uh, she said, I am not coming back to Cleveland. I have no desire. I want to stay in Connecticut. And that refusal essentially led to what became her grand tour. Her mother and father suggested as a compromise that rather than stay in Connecticut as an unmarried young woman, that the three of them together would head off over to Europe where her father, who was both self-made and self-educated as an industrialist, and her mother, who was deeply interested in music, opera, and fashion, the three of them would travel together over to Europe and explore the continent as well as the United Kingdom in the company of a fourth person in their traveling party, a gentleman by the name of Harris Whittemore, a young man who was about Theodate's age and who happened to be the son of one of her father's business partners, a Mr. Whittemore of Nagatok, Connecticut. So as you can imagine, just by my brief comment on their ages, uh, they had expectations. And by they, I mean her parents through the course of this trip that she might fall in love with young Harris and the two of them might come together and marry. A little ways into the trip, um, she declared that she had no desire to marry Harris and in fact, no desire to get married at all. And what she wanted to do instead was find something that would help her lead a meaningful and fulfilling life. It was her father who, through the course of the trip, suggested that she think about architecture as a profession, despite the fact that women were not allowed at that time to be licensed as architects. And what women could do while they could enter architectural school that they could not practice. So the reason I'm showing you this image is because this is a likeness of what Paris looked like on the family's arrival to it. They set off in the autumn of 1888. They stopped briefly in England and then went over to Paris where the city was a construction site. On one side, the Eiffel Tower was being put up 
On the other side, Sacred Core was being constructed. And it was really sort of the deep dive into this whole realm of an entirely different type of existence that any of them to this date had known. And by any of them, I mean their entire traveling party. So they go and spend the next uh, almost a year traveling in loops, if you will, around the continent, going heading south to Spain, back up to France, to Germany, over to Italy, little bits and little destinations over again into the UK and around the England and Scotland. And through the course of the trip, they are introduced to cultures, landscapes, artwork, traditions that are vastly different from anything they've ever known. It is during this trip that she and her family, and primarily it is her father who is of interest uh, for this part of the story, they purchase their first major painting. So it is a landscape by Monet, uh, a seaside view of Antibes that is made and painted in 1888, literally weeks before the purchase of it by the Pope family from the Duran Ruel Gallery. When they finish their trip and they come back home, they land on the East Coast and Theodate convinces her parents to let her stay in Farmington. She rents a small house at first, which we, she will then later purchase, and she inhabits the house with her lady's maid and her cow. Her parents go back to Ohio, and through the course of the next eight years, her father buys small plots of land from five different farmers in the region to amass over 200 acres. It is also during this period that her father convinces Stanford White and his firm to approve his daughter's drawings for a house that she will build that will become their retirement home. They break ground for the house in 1899 and it's completed in 1901. You can wonder about Theodate's inspiration and her training. The inspiration comes primarily from that very first trip that she takes through Europe, where she for the first time sees beautiful architectural structures amidst as beautiful natural landscapes, and takes that inspiration to pursue architectural studies when she's back in the United States in the 1890s with a whole series of private tutors from Harvard, from Princeton, where she learns the essence of design. She also travels around the United States because she's deeply interested in preservation and the, the, the notion of creating something new while respecting old traditions. And a very influential trip happened when she went down to visit the Mount Vernon. And while not officially documented, I deeply believe that she visited Monticello and Jefferson's home as well at the, at, at the time. But that's at this moment, utterly speculation. We do know that she was in Mount Vernon and we have a photograph of her here standing in front of it. The rendering that we have is in essentially a lookalike to the final project, project that she is to realize with a structure of 33,000 square feet, which in 1901, she and her parents move into. In the structure, it is designed as something for the ultimate comfort of her parents, her mother and her father. Whether it is from the master plan to the tiny details, um, and by a tiny detail, I will say the image on the left, you have she and her mother and father and their beloved butler who are enjoying a tea party. Her father, it's hard to tell, but he's, 5'10", 5 5'11", 5 if you will, in height. And one of the details of the house that she designed specifically was that no single pane of glass at the break between the pane would not interfere with her father's vision out and his appreciation of the surrounding landscape. So from the size to the details and everything in between, 
I interpret this house as a very grand love letter to her parents. She is aspiring for their happiness and for their comfort. And for that happiness and comfort, for example, in the drawing room of the house is a bespoke Steinway piano that was made for the Pope family and has lived every day of its life here at Hillstead. This piano is uh, the instrument, instrument, instrument upon which they would have any number of accomplished musicians come and play to entertain their guests, to entertain their friends, to entertain their family, because it was for Mrs. Pope incredibly important that she maintain her ability to share her residence, to share her life with not just her extended family, but for any number of close friends and visitors that they could persuade to come and see them in Connecticut after they re relocated there. The other aspect of the drawing room that is phenomenal is it is uh, at the moment as it was then, and I will show you in pictures, filled with the masterworks that are of mostly impressionist, but then some American artists, the masterworks that fill the room and fill the other rooms of this house. On the outside of the house, so I like to talk about Hillstead as what I consider a trifecta of masterpieces. There is the natural estate, which is at the moment 152 acres. The masterpieces that are artistic inside the house and the skin between the two is Theodate's architectural masterpiece, what would become her breakthrough project. And Within these masterpieces, any number of experiences and enrichments that can be have. We see them playing croquet outside, enjoying a beautiful conversation in front of beautiful art inside. And then at the far right, that was one of the six uh, original golf holes. Mr. Pope had his own golf course here on the on the site that he was while reportedly a duffer, and I'm told that a duffer is someone who's not very good at golf, not very accomplished and skilled. Um, he enjoyed it nonetheless and played nearly every day despite uh, bad foul weather. This is a photograph of the date with her parents at the house. We don't know the exact date. We believe it's within the first years of them moving in. You will see the resemblance to the rendering that I showed you initially. This is an image of that first Antibes Monet that Mr. Pope purchased in 1888. And as the springboard, if you will, to what became a collection of at least 40, um, possibly a few more, to date we have tracked down 40, of 40 masterpieces that were owned, uh, that were acquired and owned from 1888, this first purchase, until the last major purchase, a work by Degas in 1907. So in a little over 20 years, uh, the works that were brought into this house, the vast majority of them are uh, the Impressionist masters and artists of that ilk, both before and after Impressionism. Uh, this particular work that I'm showing you by Manet, at the time that it was acquired, um, I am somewhat crude in including the receipt um, to tell the anecdote that this was reportedly the highest price paid for a Monet at the time in 1884 when it was purchased. Uh, the Pope family, after that grand tour, made a number of visits to Europe uh, for many, many reasons, for travel, for business, and very often those, those trips involved some type of art viewing, museums, galleries, private viewings with dealers and gallerists, but also inevitably a purchase or two or three for um, and he, the Pope family had become known in the years prior to this purchase in Paris for the Americans that were searching for the best available Manet on the market. And this is the work that rose to the top and was offered to them. The family also, through the course of their collecting, owned three versions of Monet's haystacks. It is only the version on the left, the snow effect, 
that is no longer in Hillstead's collection. Um, and the reason I would like to pause to speak about this aspect is because through the course of building and maintaining this collection, the aspiration was to find the works and the examples by the artists that spoke most strongly in most compelling fashion with the family as objects that they would within their interiors not just live with, but share with their visitors in what I believe was incredibly altruistic fashion. The public realms of the house, the drawing room, the dining room, were filled with Impressionist works. And I would like to add at this point that we should understand historically in the first decade of the 20th century, how incredibly rare the experience was to walk into a large home, a grand home, whether it's in a city or the countryside, and to see multiple examples of French Impressionism right there in your midst. Um, we believe that it was anywhere from five to 10 different dining rooms in the first decade of the 20th century where you could actually have this experience in the United States. And what the family did in addition to install those works in the public spaces and understanding that to many of their visitors, this type of art was still somewhat shocking, if not almost entirely unknown. Uh, the number of Americans who had been over to Europe and viewed these works firsthand were still very small. That in, I believe, a great spirit of generosity, the family also installed major works of Impressionism and works by American artists such as Mary Cassatt, uh, who were working with the Impressionists. They installed them in the private rooms here at the at Hillstead as well. So by the private rooms, not just their own bedrooms and chambers, but also the, the bedrooms and chambers that would be occupied by their guests so that it enabled the guests to have the opportunity to look up close, uh, to start to develop an understanding of what was happening in this in the works of art, just giving them an additional private moment within privacy so that they could learn and come to terms with art that was very, very different from what most people knew at that point. The grain stacks on the left, the snow effect uh, is now in the Shelburne Museum in Vermont. And it had Mr. and Mrs. Pope and Theodate had they decided not to sell that work, we would have been the only museum in the United States to have three examples of the haystacks. Now, as it stands with the two haystacks, the white frost effect and in the bright sunlight, we are with the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston and the Art Institute of Chicago in owning two examples. It was part and parcel of their collecting philosophy, if you will, that works would be acquired, lived with, if at some later point it was deemed that the work didn't necessarily resonate or speak to them in strong fashion, it would be sold or traded or often put into storage, but storage in an aspect of the house or a realm of the house where it could still be accessed. So there was a system of constant refinement, if you will, to arrive at the works that they believed were not just the best examples available by the artist, but the ones that became most meaningful to them. So one of the things that we did back in 2022, when Hillstead celebrated its 75th anniversary as a museum, is we went and tried to recreate this collection. It took us between three and four years to track down the works of art that had been owned by the family in their entirety. So at the most comprehensive. And what I'm showing you here is a historic image of the dining room at a time that we believe is the first decade of the 20th century, as well as the works to the right that correspond with the numbers 
that were in the positions here within. The image, the room on the other side of the wall from the dining room is the drawing room. And you can see some of the artists that I've spoken of, uh, but in addition, an example by Hanoi. So we, while he was not one of the Pope family's favorite artists, he was still represented by the magnificent uh, girl with the cat. Among their favorite artists were Monet. There are nine examples that were acquired uh, through the course of the collecting. We have only a handful of them here now. There are four left, uh, Degas, Whistler, Mary Cassatt, and Manet. So there, the family lived here together very, very happily for a dozen years. And in 1913, something, uh, a tragedy struck. Uh, Alfred, her father, passed away very suddenly. And in, in their grief and the period of bereavement, one of the things that Theodate did was she made the very fateful decision to travel to London with one of her protégés and another lady's maid. And this particular protégé was not an architect, but a professor interested in what they called psychical research and spiritualism. So there is an element to Theodate and her life that is less well known even than her museum and her family and her story and the collection. And it is her pursuit of some type of spiritual connection uh, through clairvoyance and mediums and an interest in communicating with uh, the souls and the spirits of people who have passed. And she was attempting to attend a meeting and, a and speak with a series of colleagues in London with this particular protege, Dr. Friend. Uh, they decided that they would book passage and then traveled on the Lusitania. Um, Mr. Friend and her ladies made passed in the sinking and Theodate survived. And in the wake of that tragedy and her understanding of what that might possibly mean for her, she decided that her purpose was to honor her father, her life's purpose going forward. Uh, it was her friend, the artist Mary Cassatt, who played a very strong role in convincing her that uh, both what we can do for one another is to work to educate one another, but the other thing that we can do is recognize our purpose when it comes to us. So Theodate returns, um, I should say uh, here, this is the photograph that she had commissioned of herself after the sinking to send back to her mother uh, to prove to her mother that she is alive and well. She had sent a telegram to let her know that she had survived, but had had no visual contact. Obviously back then that wasn't possible, um, but she had it commissioned to let her mother know of her well-being if such thing happens after a trauma. When she comes back finally, gets brave enough to get on a boat again and comes back finally, she decides her life's work is going to be to found a school and to found a school specifically for boys in the neighboring town of Avon, Connecticut. So whereas her alma mater at Miss Porter's in Farmington occupies one role educating young women, she's going to endeavor to educate young men. And she becomes everything for this school. She buys the land, she designs the entire campus, she sets the curriculum, and she finances it. So from the late teens, early 20s, all the way through until her death in 1946, she considers the magnus opus of her life and her architectural career to be this school and this campus. As you can imagine, um, educating young boys is a challenging thing at any time and under any circumstances, but it is during the depression as well as World War II that it becomes the most challenging financially. So what Theodate does is she sells some of their 
the collections from, I'm sorry, some of the paintings from their fine art collection. And here I have an example of one of the Monets that she sold, as well as a photograph of the ledger that is uh, currently housed in the Nodler archive um, at the Getty, and which gives the indication of when she did this and to whom she sold it. We were very excited when we found this information because we, according to this, it was purchased by Helen Clay Frick. And we thought that was just fantastic that a painting that had been acquired early on from the artist brought to Hillstead that the other place that it lived was went from one great family collection to another at the Frick. And um, however, we found out uh, quick quickly into our research that Helen didn't purchase it uh, to add to the collection. She purchased it for one of her favorite employees, uh, which was one of her attorneys. She gave it to him as a gift. Uh, it passed down through successive owners and now is currently in a private collection in Japan. So when Hillstead opened as a museum in 1947, it is with a fraction of the Impressionist collection that her family built, as I mentioned, between 1888 and 1907. This is a contemporary photograph of the interior of the drawing room. And what, what we have done is tried to recreate exactly what the paintings looked like at the time of her passing in 1946. One of the reasons that we do this is because the Hillstead Museum is not dissimilar from the Barnes Foundation in the sense that we are governed by a will that very, very clearly articulates Theodate's wishes and her mandates, I guess is a, is a good way to put it. Hillstead is an entirely fixed institution in the sense that nothing can be added to the collection nothing can leave the collection, not by sale or not by loan. So that what is here in the house today be, has become an authentic time capsule, if you will, of a moment in time of their family and the notion of all of the different aspects of education that, that can be derived from this whether it's social history, whether it's feminist history, whether it's art history, whether it's agricultural history, because also on the premises, there is a working farm that was established actually a year before Hillstead, before they broke ground for the house itself. So there is a wealth here at Hillstead and Theodate's desire was that it stay intact and in its comprehensive, accurate portrayal, it can become a resource in the future. A few other things that she mandated in the will is that Hillstead must stay relevant and serve its mission. We are a museum that doesn't need to fabricate or guess. She clearly said to us that the mission of this institution is to benefit and to serve the public. And so we take that mission very seriously, not just through visits to Hillstead to see the interiors, but all of the programming that we do that goes along with the day-to-day -day operations. One of the joys of Theodate's story is her relationship with other women and colleagues who were pioneering in the same spirit that she was. When you come to Hillstead today, you will see the sunken garden. And I show it to you on the left without people and on the right filled with people. The sunken garden was a project by the pioneering landscape architect Beatrix Ferrand. And Beatrix designed this garden, we believe in the first decade of the 20th century. The beds themselves were covered over and it was only during an exhibition in the 1980s when there were scholars that were trying to, revi trying to revive Beatrix's appreciation and understanding of her career that a local historian saw a mention of a project for Mrs. John Wallace Riddle. What I didn't mention thus far, because we haven't talked about 
the private aspect of Theodate's life is while she had said she would not marry, she went back on that decision. A year to the day of having survived the sinking of the Lusitania, she married a gentleman by the name of John Wallace Riddle, who was an ambassador and a diplomat. He was the last ambassador to Tsarist Russia. He had multiple posts in Asia, as well as after they were married to posts in Argentina. And upon seeing this mention of a project, it, it was a head scratcher for this particular scholar. And he, on his own initiative, started to dig in and discovered that the garden itself had been designed for Hillstead and had disappeared over the years. So what the what the historian did with the leadership at Hillstead is they devised an entire collaboration with a contemporary landscape architect and two different garden groups to raise the money to accomplish this. And they revived the garden as well as the plantings to discover exactly the intention of Ferrand and her working together with Theodate. And I show you this, uh, this particular picture to emphasize the fact that there was actual collaboration on all fronts. It was an idea that the outside creative natural landscape masterpiece would in a way be in harmony and concert with the interiors of the house, both uh, the coloration and the palette of the impressionist paintings as well as the tonality of the decorative arts. So where that leads us to in this day and age, I told you a little bit about the, maybe we can call it restrictiveness of Theodate's last will and testament, and that we cannot change the nature of the collection or the institution but one of the things that we can do is we found a way through the course of the pandemic uh, to realize a project that had been begun at the beginning of the 21st century, which was to create a space where we could tell the many stories behind Theodate, behind the family, behind the collection. When you come to Hillstead now, you can visit the historic house in a general highlights tour it takes about an hour, but through the course of that hour, you don't even scratch the surface of what's there. And so we engaged a local architecture firm, Centerbrook, to come and help us renovate one of the spaces to create what would be a state-of-the-art gallery. So the before, the after, and what we do with it. So what we do in this space, like I said, is tell the stories and find ways to bring the history to present day and make it meaningful. The image on the left is showing uh, one wall of the installation of, uh, of when we had gathered together the works, the entire work of the Pope collection in 2022. The image on the right, we did a delightful investigation into the architect's use of the chair and the design of the chair and juxtaposed contemporary examples with Theodate's own examples from her architecture and design. We did another exhibition where we collaborated with uh, contemporary artists in Brooklyn to explore the whole spiritual nature of Theodate's history uh, using clairvoyance and mediums. And the exhibition that we have presently is we are trying to provide context to what it was to be a woman of pioneering nature who was born in that year. Uh, a showcase, if you will, of women, uh, post-Civil War women and the various incredible things that they accomplished. Looking ahead, uh, I had mentioned that Mary Cassatt was one of Theodate's friends. She was indeed a close friend of the family. We believe that she had advised the popes on at least one major purchase of a dugga. And what we are planning now is to, for the centennial of Mary's death in 2026, to delve deeper into this relationship between Mary and the family and find out in what ways we can tell the story to more fully appreciate Mary as an artist and as a creative force, as well as a very influential female character 
in the appreciation of Impressionist art in this country. Uh, we refer to her in-house as the transatlantic woman of consequence. Um, I have a few photographs here. One of the things that they often did was photograph one another. Uh, Theodate was uh, a woman who owned her own camera all the way back into the 1890s. And it was a hobby and an interest that Mary and Theodate shared. Two images uh, of Mary here at Hillstead taken by Theodate. Evidence of the closeness of their friendship. Um, on one of their visits to France, Mary shared with the family her recipe for caramels. They saw one another both in France, in Paris, in, in the countryside, as well as here in the United States. Uh, when Mary came to Farmington, to Hillstead, they saw one another in New York, they saw one another in Philadelphia. So uh, an idea of the depth of their friendship. Um, I will show you three or four works that were formerly in the collection that were acquired from Mary. And then this third, this is the only Cassatt painting left here at Hillstead. The others having been sold either by the Popes during Mr. Pope's lifetime or afterwards by Theodate, uh, we believe to fund the school. And then lastly, I show you my favorite work in the collection, uh, which is by Degas, the tub, the last major purchase in 1907. And this is the work that we believe Mary had a very, very, very influential role in convincing the Pope family to purchase it. And that's the end of my talk. Anna, thank you so much. This was such a treat. And for those of you who are not in the United States um, or not on the East Coast. Um, Farmington, Connecticut is just a two hour drive outside of New York City. Is that right, Anna? Two hours. Yep. North, Depending on traffic, you can get there sometimes under two hours. All right. So um, hopefully a, a destination for this spring for all of you watching online. Um, so now we come to our Q&A uh, portion of our presentation. And as I said, please, please write your uh, questions in the chat, but I am gonna take the opportunity in asking you my questions, which I have many. Um, and one of them, it starts out as an observation um, and it was sparked by your showing us of the Haystack series that the Pope's had acquired early on. And I would think, Anna, that it's very unusual for a single collector to acquire um, multiples of a series. And I wonder um, to what extent was Theodate's eye and interest as an architect influencing her father's purchase of not only the series paintings and their investigation of light and shadow in different times of day, which would be something that would be of interest to an architect, but to what extent was Theodate really advising her artists and is, is her own taste as an architect um, evident in the selections that were made for the collection? I think it was a very fluid dialogue. I think that her, you know, obviously her father was the guiding force as the person writing the checks in, in the and And he was, he was deeply moved by the art of his time. He distinguishes, well, not just he, but their collection is distinguished in a fine art sense of their, of their ilk, of their resources. They were not juxtaposing old masters with contemporary masters, the, the art of the now. They focused entirely in the fine arts on the art of the now. So they, they came at it from such a open-minded and daring position. I believe that it, they came at it with the full creative and intellective, intellectual context of the family. So that exactly what, what you're saying, that Theodate would see things trained as a designer, trained to create space and how that space moves through various times of the day or the, the change of that space through various times of the day, that is her sensibility. Whereas her father's sensibility to the 
physical, the visual, and then her mother's sensibility to the to the musical aspect of it. Yeah. I think you see all three of those though they were equals. It, it was almost like a trinity, if you will. Um, and what we have in our archives that report, whether they're her diaries or their letters, you see that fluidity and mutual respect and that openness of idea. I mean, there there's a progressiveness to almost everything about Hillstead, it, which is ironic because it it looks like, you know, a white house with pillars. But when you pull the curtain back, you see, I, I love to I love to think about, you know, what the progressiveness of two grown people saying to their when their teenage daughter says, no, 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 but a radical no to all of this expectation. And then how they respond to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you have to find something that you want to do that's meaningful and even suggesting aspects to her. And then her father being the person to secure Stanford White and his firm. I can't help but giggle. It makes me think like it would be me getting Frank Gehry's firm to put his name on my 17 year old son's like untrained <laughs> drawings that, that, that I think that this is a long answer, Elizabeth, but I think that that that's the spirit of here that, that it's, it's fluid, it's open. They had a, they had a philosophy, an ethos, if you will, that was if you wanted well-being, you had to cultivate the life of the mind inside and a direct relationship with nature outside. And each of them might have specialized in various aspects of that, but they were all it, there was connection right. between them and openness of conversation. And that's why you see, for example, the the Sunken Garden by Beatrix Ferrand. And it, it the, the amount of research that they did in the 80s to discover exactly what type of flower and the historic bloom, the heritage, and to see that how how much they they wanted to understand how the drawing room with the Monet haystack inside was in conversation with that work outside. That's that's a team. You know, that's all of them there together. Yeah, it's quite a holistic approach to aesthetic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's one question that is coming from Dora Williams, and it is, was Theodate's interest in spiritualism spurred by her father's death, or did it predate that? Thank, excellent question. Um, we have uh, indication that it goes all the way back to uh, her childhood that she had an experience as a young girl that she could not explain. Um, and by young girl, I mean, under 10, um, you know, she, she was a young, she was a child and she had a particular experience and that was what started. That's what started this interest. And it, we have, we have the various ways that she cultivated it, whether meeting with mediums or we even have letters between her and Mary Cassatt. I mean, it wasn't known to us that Mary Cassatt also shared this interest in spiritualism, but they exchanged books and talked about various mediums um, all through the most of our letters are from the first decade of the 20th century. So Theodate's in her 30s. And uh, her father doesn't die until 13. So it, it goes all the way from childhood. And, and she really pursues this aggressively, but um, robustly. Mm -hmm. At one point in her life, she even endowed a professorship at Harvard for psychical research, but then ended up uh, taking the money back because they, they wanted to tell her how they were going to run it. And she didn't quite like that. Like that. And just just to be clear, the interest in in spirituality um, and mediums in that sense, it was it was kind of in vogue, wasn't it? At at that yeah. time, she wasn't alone as as someone a collector, a progressive person interested in this type of thing. It was it, it was there was a whole slice of individuals and of all different walks of life. Uh, there were, a, one of the reasons she was going to London was because there were societies of psychical research based in New York, based in Boston, and she had been working with them and had disagreements with them and was deciding maybe go across the pond and you might find more like-minded 
spirits, I hate to use that word, but um, individuals. Yeah. So, so it's interesting also it, with her interest in that, did she in her um, interest in paintings start to pursue artists who might have had similar interests at the time as well? Or did her collecting, you said her collecting stopped in 1907. She yeah. didn't make any overtures to collecting more contemporary artists as time went on who might've shared uh, common interests? Um, not the, not fine art. So she, um, I guess I should, I should be more clear. The last fine art, major fine art purchase was 1907. Um, she did, uh, there were decorative pieces and a few more minor pieces, but she was, her relationships with those artists, uh, the artists, I mean, specifically Kassat, it they, they came together, I don't think necessarily because, just because of Kassat's work as an artist, it was a plethora of of interests that they had in common. So whether they have, uh, whether it was historic houses or country houses, or just a debate on the nature, they had long conversations about public versus private ownership of, of artwork, uh, very strong feelings. Um, she didn't, so Theodate was not, uh, she was not a person, as we would know now, a, a contemporary collector to be driven by putting your thumb on the pulse of the moment. And as the moment changes, staying with that pulse. Mm -hmm. No, that that wasn't that wasn't really her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you had you obviously you talked about um, Mary Cassatt and um, friends that she had who were um, involved in the arts, either in landscape architecture and her friends from Miss Porter's. It seems like there are a lot of strong female friendships that she had in her life. Did she, was she friendly with the Havemeyers and other people of her social class who were also collecting? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So um, it was, uh, for example, you know, you one that needs to be mentioned, uh, the woman from Miss Porter's, who ended up being the founder founder of another private school for girls called Westover, she Mary Hillard uh, recruited Theodate to come and be the architect for part of that campus. Um, but she was not limited to the creative types. Her, she found she was introduced to her husband, for example, by Anna Roosevelt, who mm -hmm. lived down the street here in Farmington. Anna was Teddy's sister. And Anna married a local gentleman by the last name of Cowles, C-O-W-L-E-S. And it was through Anna that she met John. Um, she was, they were very well connected, if you will, to both cultural realms, political realms, business realms. So the list of people who have come here to visit at Hillstead and who have sat in the chairs that we still have or slept in the beds and those sorts of things. It's anywhere from Henry James, who was a good friend of hers, uh, to Eleanor Roosevelt, to uh, uh, Catherine Hepburn, um, trying to think of others. There's a whole list of notables, if you will, so who, have, who have been here. Do you have an archive at Hillstead that's accessible for researchers? And could you talk a little bit about do. her papers? We do. Yeah. So the, the archives are up on the third floor. So now the first two floors of the, most of the first two floors are part of the historic house tour. Um, the servants quarters are off limits and they are either staff offices like myself, I'm in the laundry room, or up on the third floor is where we keep all of our archives. The archives came into being, uh, it was in the 1980s. There was a debate that was happening about when the, the year that she was born. Imagine a woman lying about how old she was and someone had the, the very good idea to go check in the family Bible because we the their book collection is here as well. Uh, and when they did several pieces of paper, fell out and they realized at that point, uh, we don't really know what's hidden in these books. We've never been through them volume by volume. And that was the first step. They went through, they cataloged the books and all of the various papers, letters, certificates, um, that became the foundation for the archive. 
So from that foundation, we have supplemented it in the last 30, 40 years. Uh, our most recent gift uh, was from a woman whose grandfather was the farm manager here. And among the many treasures, we have the tree diary. So um, Mr. and Mrs. Pope were in such a hurry when they relocate. Well, not such a hurry. They didn't have time to waste. Let's put it that way. And on this gigantic property, they did not want to plant baby trees and let them grow. They, tr they uprooted, transported, and planted full-grown trees. So we have the entire manuscript, if you will. Uh, this tree came from there. This is the type. It was put in that spot that goes all the way back to 1901. Uh, but we have we have her letters, uh, copies of her letters, the correspondence for all of the family members, probably the most, um, the thinnest are her father's. Um, most of his are business things. We're not sure, but we believe at one point they destroyed his personal papers. So we, there's a there's not much in that respect. But from her, from her mother and from the many, many individuals who came and went here, we have a trove. Did she keep a diary? Yes, she kept a diary. Um, not her entire life, but we have various aspects of her life that go back the earliest is from that grand tour in 1888. And we were very, very fortunate again in the 1980s, um, family members, descendants uh, translated it. So I'm a, I'm a, Catholic school girl who knows how to write in cursive and have lived in many places around the world. And so I can read it. Hers is indecipherable. We cannot <laughs> read her handwriting. But we were very, very fortunate because family members who could transcribed them. Oh, and cool. so we have the typescript copy of these as well. Oh, fantastic. Um, I have one last question for you before we wrap up, and it's from Milan Houston. Hi, Milan. Um, Philip Johnson had a younger sister, Theodate, and from Cleveland, was she a relation? Hello, Mylan. It's been a while. Um, yes, they are related. So Theodate's father was Philip Johnson's grandfather. So oh. Theodate, Theodate and Philip Johnson were officially are were cousins, and one can imagine. Uh, how fun the architectural discussions were uh, between. <laughs> I love to imagine this, knowing that when Theodate first sets foot in Paris, the Eiffel Tower is going up on one side, Sacre Coeur is going up on the other, that, you know, Philip would have made a beeline <laughs> to the Eiffel Tower with all of its progress and technology and materials, and Theodate would have beelined right to the revival style of, of Sacre Coeur. So she is about preservation and keeping the old new. And I'm not going to talk about what Philip is about. Um, well, newness, exploration of the new. Well, and, and Glass House, not very far away from you. Not very far at all, about 50 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that we did during our renovation during the pandemic, we were not because Hillstead is a national historic landmark. It is protected by the state and the federal preservation regulations. So we were not allowed to touch the footprint at all. We took one of the spaces and essentially in, it had been an open air shed. Uh, she was a bit of a motorhead and owned a lot of cars. Um, and so this open air shed, first for the carriages, then for the cars, we we used glazing to transition that space from open air to an interior room. And it is all glass on one side and all glass on the other. So while they have their glass house, we have our glass room here <laughs> with incredible views of the landscape. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marlon, for that question. And I'm sorry to say we are out of time, but Anna, this has been wonderful. I really appreciate your sharing this with us. And again, I'm, I'm, I can't wait to go to the Hillstead this spring. Um, and uh, thank you all for attending today. Um, Anna, it was a delight. And for those of you interested in continuing uh, with our series, we have another presentation on April 3rd from the curator's 
of the Udrup Guard Museum in Denmark, who are going to speak about their current exhibition, Impressionism and its Overlooked Women. So please stay tuned for more details about that. Um, and thank you all for attending. Bye-bye.